What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up? What up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh-huh. Rebel Radio is going down. Would you say Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to Rebel Radio. I'm your host, Josh Levine. My guest today is the co-founder of uprocks.com. He was also a uh, co-founder of Rockus Records, which was the launching pad for Most Def, Talib Kweli, Company Flow, which gave us LP, uh, High and Mighty, R.A. the Rugged Man, Pharaoh Monch. Lots of um, important underground hip-hop stars came out of there. I love what he has to say about successful people having a strong mission statement, and he's going to challenge us all to identify what's your superpower. He also gives us our new tagline for Rebel Radio, where crazy people come to share their stories. I love it. And uh, and also just a great question for up and coming creative people. Do you have to make all your money through your art to feel like you're really an artist? There's so many good lessons in this episode. I hope you enjoy it. Also make sure you check out our partners over at EDM.com for all the sickest electronic music hip-hop, lots of stuff over there for you. And right now, let's hear from Jared Meyer. Yeah, go. But no, I was going to say, you know, there's such a fascination with success, right? Right. And, you know, there's this idea that these things can be learned. Right. And... But, you know, I, sometimes I wonder if that's true. Like, I find when I meet successful people, like, the one, there's something that they have in common. Yeah. Which is, like, a very strong mission statement. And I was telling this to Kwali when I was at South By with him. Like, I think back a lot to when I met him. He had no music. His clothes weren't where he right. wanted them to be. Yeah. His, his street, you know, people didn't really know him. And yet he had this, like, his mission statement was was fucking on, right? Um, he knew that music was going to be a way for him to, to deliver on that mission statement. Mm. And I look back at almost everybody uh, that I've met that's been really successful, and I've been kind of blown away by their mission statement. And it's funny, when I was watching Jay Cole on his HBO special, did you see that? No. Uh-uh. It's just pretty tight. Yeah. Um, I felt like he had an incredibly strong mission statement. And the second I saw him talking about his mission statement, yeah. that I had this insane flashback to meeting Kwali for the mm. first time. Interesting. Yeah. And um And is th- that but but like yeah. a lot of unsuccessful people have Right. Well there's a so there's a couple right? yeah, I mean there's a couple of things to be said about having mission statements. One is like it's cool for your mission statement to be ongoing. Yeah. You know, um, so you're 25 years old and you don't have a life mission statement, right? It's okay. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. But but at the same time, like, just know that might be why you're not Tupac. Sure. Just know that might might be why you're not Steve Jobs. Yeah. Because I bet you at 25 their shit was pretty tight. For sure. Yeah. That's interesting. And, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think like so much of that goes then. So you have your mission statement. Yeah. I want to I want to hear what yours is, but right. but we'll get there. But but like but then you got put into work. Yeah. And so, you know, I feel like there, you know, for me, like um, I feel like there's a formula a little bit. I yeah. mean, the biggest part of the formula is having enormous amounts of talent. Well, actually, <laughs> OK. Right, right. So really, OK. Here's, here's, I think, the, the formula is figuring out who you are. Okay. Right? What's, what's your superpower? Yeah. Once you figure out what your superpower is, you know your job uh, on the team. Mm-hmm. So for me, and that you kind of alluded to before, my superpower is amplification. Okay. Right? And translating. So... Like I might meet you, and there's something special about you. Like you're, 
you're an incredible writer, you're an incredible thinker, you're an incredible rapper. Mm. And like my head, I'm, I'm all three. You, of those. No, you are. You're super, yeah. super fresh. And so my head's like, man, like this guy has something special. And what I've learned through life is, you know, your your first instinct if, if you can't do those things is like, well, they don't really need me. Sure. Right. I mean, it's yeah. like, yeah, that doesn't align. With I'm not good. Right. Talent. Like, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to play the NPC for them. I'm not going to right. rap for them. Right. right? They, they do that. So they don't right. really need me. But, you know, the, the successes in life come from putting different people's superpowers together. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out, you know, your your very special thing. Right. And figuring out what someone else's very special thing is. And seeing if they kind of go together and if they need each other. Yeah. Because if I if I'm someone who translates, yeah. And if I'm someone who amplifies, then I need you need stuff to then I need something to translate to the world right. and something to amplify to the world. If you're somebody who makes magic, and you're just like you're just busy fucking creating magic, mm -hmm. well then you need a couple of things, right? You need someone to protect that magic. That's like right. a great lawyer, uh, a great manager, sure. right? Someone who oversees, like, you know, your intellectual property, like, whatever that is. Maybe it's a production company. Mm -hmm. You need someone to translate it, to build an audience around it, maybe to help you build your brand. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people that are just really good at creating one part of something special in art, they they don't necessarily get the other uh, essential part in art. Sure, yeah. So I always say, like, figure out, like, what your superpower is, you know, and, and hone that. I love it. And, and go it. go all in on that. That's cool. Well, I, I'm excited to dig into that. I do, <laughs> I do want to take a step back. First of all, thanks for being Thank here. Thank you for having me. No, I mean, I'm, I, I appreciate you making the time for this, and, and I'm excited. Um, I think you have a really interesting story cool. that I just only know pieces of it. But, right. You know, we're going to learn more about that um, and, and, and specifically how you've carried this superpower across multiple industries now. Right you know, from music now to media. But I always like to start at the beginning. Um, and it's funny because, you know, we've like sort of known each other for a long yep. time. But now but now we're like we're together all the time. Yeah, because now our, our kids <laughs> play basketball together. Now, now, now we're um, together all the time. And yeah, it's, that's pretty funny. And so, um, but I want to hear how you got there. So take, get, let's start at the, at the very okay, beginning. Okay, so cool. And I'm going to start at the beginning. But I also want to say like why, why I'm here is because I got the sense from listening to your podcast that this is a place where people that feel creative or that are entrepreneurs, and I love those people, right? Yeah. So like I, I was explaining you know, a moment ago, like my superpower is amplifying those people and yeah. working with those people, um, and I'm attracted to their craziness. Mm. So I feel like this is, where the, this is where the crazy people go. They come, <laughs> they come to listen to this podcast. This is where I want to be. We're not where hip-hop lives. We're, we're where the crazy this people is, go. I want to be where crazy people go. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I love that. It's another dimension. And, you know, you, you have to know the special code to get into yeah. this world. So no, I, I love thank it. you. I love it. And uh, so, so that, that's so. So I want to hear, you know, how it started for you. Mm -hmm. and, and I also want to, because I know you're, a father of two young boys yeah. and, and our boys play basketball together. That's right. And so something that's on my mind a lot that I'm sure must be on yours is like, how do you teach your kids this stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. how do you set them up to find their superpower and right. And, yeah, you know, no, that's a great that. that's a great I mean, I definitely think about I think it's like kind of related to the things that I'm really interested in yeah. is, is being a father yeah. and, and just um learning in general teaching mm -hmm, and like mm -hmm. what what people learn so yeah we, we could definitely go there yeah i'm always with my son like oh you why are you not practicing eight hours a day like you have to oh i never do that i don't say it to him <laughs> oh, in i your don't mind. say it to him yeah in, in your mind. mind i'm like oh yeah you could be working on your jump shot right now right like, right 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 but no i'm not gonna do that to him that would you know did you ever manage anybody you manage people yeah, right? Yeah, you were, yeah. right so then yeah. you know as a manager yeah you, you can't, can't ever tell anybody no, anything of course, of course. <laughs> ask questions right right actually I'm, I'm bad i actually know you've been a manager so um okay so how'd you get started you first go. of all like how'd you get into music in the first place right so uh i grew up in new york city yeah and uh you know i was born in the early 70s so what so let's let's go what, what's the first record that you remember well, I mean, uh, a couple a couple of things had a strong impact on me that I remember. I, I, I always, 
when I think of parents, or like, or like at least like my parents and like their friends in the 70s, mm -hmm. I think of Chuck Mangion. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I think of Chuck Mangion and like Billy Joel. Like well, that. Chuck Mangione, that's a fascinating record because, like, uh, and I forget the name of the song. I'm sure you know it. But yeah, it, yeah it, like, it escapes me too. It's right like now. a number one hit mm -hmm. with no vocals. Right. At a time when that wasn't really happening. Right. I mean, I don't think you could do that now. And, and, uh, and, and I think you could always do it. But with like a trumpet lead. With a trumpet lead. The, yeah. Yeah. James, like, what's yeah. that song called? I don't know, but I. Y'all know it. Yeah. Right. I mean, anyone who, by the way, anyone who's ever collected records knows. That's a dope ass record, though. Yeah. Anyone uh, who's collected, real, like, anyone who's collected records, they they all know that record. Um, and like you know, the uh, the other one, when I kind of joke with with um, uh, Brian Brader, who I uh -huh. grew up with, and we started Raucous Records together. Yeah. But we we joke a lot about like Billy Joel too. Like really. Like Billy Joel seemed like that one inescapable like parent record if you had like. <laughs> Okay. If you had like white parents, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, probably the only white parents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you yeah. had like white parents, they probably owned Billy Joel, Chuck Manjoan. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is if you were on the bus going to school, I mean, like, so like 1979, I guess, like you were hearing Rapper's Delight. Right. Yeah. Like all the time. Yeah. And you were hearing Blondie, right? Sure. And, um, you know, music made like a really, really big impact on me, and and not just music. Um, very early on, I was very fascinated by what music represented. I was able to actually separate in my mind the difference between music and the culture of music, mm -hmm. and they they had um, they had very different places in in, in my world. Um, so you know. At that time, you know, so this is late seventies, early eighties in New York. You could really figure out, and you still can to some degree, right? Like people really had to wear their identities on their sleeves, right? Yeah. I'm a heavy metal dude. I'm a punk rock dude. I'm yeah. a ska dude, and I was just, you know, uh, uh, whatever, very fascinated by that, and just kind of wanted to visit all of those worlds. And so, were you in one of those so styles? Ah, well, this is this is this is sort of the funny thing I think, um, because I was very fascinated by by all of that, and I was just fascinated by youth culture in general, and this is obviously pre-internet. I started, you know, collecting records, and one of the things I would do with collecting records is want to see like how people looked, mm. and um, I can remember doing things like like wanting to know, like so, like the West Coast, like. What do, what do young people look like on the West Coast and buying like Jodie Foster's army, like skate punk and, oh, sure. and like that kind of thing and be like, oh, let's dress like that. <laughs> you know? like, or, you know, um, getting like before, like before it even hit college radio, like buying like Jesus and Mary Chain was like an import mm. and like, oh, trench coats and wraparound. Let's dress like that. <laughs> and, you know, if, if someone's like, oh, you want to come to like a nightclub? And I was like, oh, well, like, okay, I got to dress like how people dress when they go to like Nell's or like sure. whatever they do, you know? Yeah. Um, and to me, it was all a little bit of a costume, no matter what, mm -hmm. you know, it's always mm -hmm. kind of fun. It's interesting. Like the one I just, you know, I wasn't stoked on looking like, um, you know, like 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 a preppy sort of like jock or anything like that. That was the only costume I wasn't like super interested in. Right. You know, yeah. uh, like definitely was way interested in like music and culture and reading yeah. and um, and so anything that kind of like helped like illuminate those cultures like, mm -hmm. like spoke to me. Mm -hmm. And I had friends. You know, I had friends that that were that were. I was I. People would might say, "Oh, that guy was around," mm -hmm. so people maybe thought like, "Oh, he was part of that." Right. But I always felt deep down, like a visitor, because yeah. I was always like, "This is cool," but I also want to like, mm -hmm. I can't say, "Oh, I'm all about going to CBGBs on Sunday," right? Because I'm also really interested in, in going to this club on Friday night, and like they have nothing. Like they right. actually, like, you can't be the same person and go to those two places. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that was a, a type. You know, I was a little bit of that myself. You were which one? You um, were you were dedicated to one scene? No, like or you were uh, you were a visitor too. Yeah, like I was. Visitors are cool. 
I don't get a lot of credit. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, <laughs> we don't get a lot of no, credit. No, but that's the thing. Like, I, it's it's not. But I think there were a group of us uh, people like that. That like, you know, my friends like we were into hip hop and we were into modern rock yeah. and we were into reggae and you know, a few things. But and we'd kind of bounce around a yeah. little bit. Um, but. Uh, but I feel like that was the exception at the time, right? And yeah, no, totally. I think now now it seems more normal. That's what I was saying. Yeah. I feel like that's, you know, I feel like now, you know, you can't look at somebody necessarily and know what, what they're into, uh, and, you know, unless. I heard this uh, this great thing from Stretch Armstrong once who, you know, was really influential to me. And you know, in, in in a massive way, actually. Yeah. So shout out to him. Um, so was someone was saying like they they went and saw it. I don't remember exactly. It, pardon me, stretch if I'm getting your story wrong. But it was something to the effect like they went and saw a, a DJ gig and they were kind of confused because he was playing house music. Right. And they were like, "Wait, I don't understand. Like your radio show is this is a hip hop yeah. radio show." Yeah. And he's like, "Yeah." But I don't only like listen. Like I, my show had to be one thing, and I wanted my show to be the best at one sure. thing. But just know that like I do all these other things, so don't confuse like me, like the you know, the human that loves music, mm -hmm. with the fact that I wanted the best hip hop radio show. Mm -hmm. And and to some degrees, I know I'm I'm about to skip a lot of things, but that that was that was Raucous Records. Okay, right? Yeah. I had a lot of loves. Sure. But when it came time to figuring out like what that label needed to be amazing at, yeah, it needed to be amazing at that one thing. And so, uh, but Rockets didn't. So it it ended up being a hip hop label, and, and you know, very much the sort of you know a leader in, in yeah. kind of underground backpack yeah. hip hop. Um, but you so was that the vision from the beginning? I mean, the, the the vision was definitely for it to be uh, like some of the labels that I loved, and and I definitely wanted it to be very you know, which was like a niche label, right? right. So like labels that like really were influential to me, like SST was one. Like I'll just buy anything that said SST on it. Mm. So I wanted that type of impact, mm -hmm. but also like I wasn't always sure what I was going to get with SST either, right? right? Sure. Um, it wasn't like you were going to always get a record that sounded like Black Flag. Right. You could get something that was strange or different or, you yeah. know, um, and depending on like how, you know, your taste in music, you could understand this difference between Black Flag and, and Bad Brains or something right. like that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, definitely the, the thing for Raucous was to predominantly um, be a hip hop label, but I wanted to try different things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I wanted it to be able to grow and to expand. And early on, I was hoping to kind of plant some of those seeds. Um, we, you know, we, we definitely tried very hard at one point to be um, a player in drum and bass. Mm -hmm. like that was something that I think we all had, like, you know, we'd have passions for. Yeah. Um, Brian and I would, would take trips to the UK, you know, to promote our rap records. Mm -hmm. And we'd end up going to these, you know, jungle and drum and bass shows, and we're just like, "That shit's fresh." Right. Like, I think we, could, I think we could bring this back, right? You know, and, and you try things, and you, you, you know, you have experiments. There's this great story that's uh, uh, from your podcast that Sasha Jenkins tells um, about uh, Daryl Jennifer getting, mm -hmm. you know, a record deal, and I don't, I don't know if he, if he said the label or or my name. Yeah, I, I don't, remember. I don't think he did. But that's, you know, and that was me because I was like, of course I want to do that deal. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, you know, the hope was to to be a little bit more eclectic as as we grew. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, even from the beginning, like, it would have been cool to have some, like, eclectic wins. Um, but, of course, the, I mean, the heart and soul of, of that label was, you know, the, the Moses and the Qualies. Mm -hmm. And, the, I mean, those guys to me were, I mean, they're... They're icons. They were they were icons before they were icons. Is that right? Yeah, I mean they they carried themselves in a certain way. I mean, you know, it the the everyone who worked for me understood there was no like there was no well we tried but the record didn't get on the radio. Well, we tried but the video didn't get on BET. That was 
it had to happen. Not gonna happen. Like, you are not coming back in this office yeah. until that job is done. Yeah. Um, you know, those those guys were they were special. And, you know, I I I truly in my heart felt like I was signing Bob Marley. Mm-hmm. You know, um John Lennon. Like mm-hmm. I felt like I, these people had a lot to say and and wanted to change the world and I feel like they, they did. I, I, I have to tell you Almost, it feels like almost every day, you know, I run into somebody who tells me that the Black Star album changed their life. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, that that feels really good. Yeah, I bet. So, so uh, well, back up for a second. So, you and Brian started the label together. Yeah. But you guys have been friends since you Yeah, were... so, Gary, so let me back way up. So, you know, got interested in record collecting, which yeah. was like, you know, other kids after school played sports and stuff like that. And, like, I just like to go to the record store and just, like, look at mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes we bought stuff, sometimes we didn't. And, yep. But it just felt like a very magical place to me. Like, somehow, the secrets to unlocking uh, my adolescent confusion was in the racks uh-huh. of the record store. Yeah. And... Brian mm-hmm. seemed like someone who would be interested in taking that journey with me. And so we used to get off the bus and go to record stores together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we'd look at all different types of records and jazz records and import records. And um, we discovered a love for jazz together at the same time. Mm-hmm. And uh, Brian's a very good musician. He actually uh, puts out music okay. today. And um, we played music. And we were, you know, we, we, we lived and breathed it. Mm-hmm. And um, what was it? What, what was the jazz record that was influential? Well, um, I mean, you know, like like the West Montgomery records, the Cannibal Adderley records. Mm-hmm. But, you know, truthfully for me, and, and there's like a, it's funny when you meet people who are real hip hop fans. And you ask them about like the jazz records. Right. It, like uh, they're they're usually ones that, like uh, it's samples. Yeah, it's it's a lot of times it's it's breaks like they, they get into it through breaks yeah. or shit they heard like Q-Tip talking about, yeah. you know, yeah. or like I mean that's what happened to me. Right, right. Yeah. I mean there's a couple of dudes in hip hop who basically turned on everyone to jazz. Yeah, and so it's like those records that everyone knows. Oh, what did Ron Carter play on? Mm-hmm. Right, because he got mm-hmm. shout out. You know. Right. Um, but for me, I, I legitimately fell in love with with jazz. Yeah. And uh, to this day, love all forms of jazz, not just the kind of jazz that. You know, you could kind of chop up and, and put on a hip hop record. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I have a, a fascination with with French jazz and and, and swing and yeah. and uh, you know, obviously, like the the stuff that most people end up loving, right, is like the the, the blue note hard sure. hard bop records. Right. And, and and like you know, there's not a day of my life that goes by I probably don't listen to some of that stuff too. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, and that ended up being like a cool thing as I as I got more and more into hip hop. I feel like I kind of grew up around hip hop just being in in New York and like, but I definitely had friends who were more into it than than I was. Mm-hmm. Um, it made a lot more sense to me when I wanted to start to like you know have a social life and like go out and like yeah. I was like oh okay so girls don't want to come over and listen to like bitches brew <laughs> not so much not so much. But it, it actually kind of shocked me a little bit. Was I was that, like, was there, was there some trial and error in there? There was a little trial and error. There was a little trial and error. <laughs> okay. Um, That's life experience. Man. Well, I'll tell you, like, so, you know, I grew up on the Upper East Side in New York City. I went to prep school. And, you know, there was this sort of like, hey, man, can we meet, like, non-prep school girls? You right. know, like, girls who go to clubs. Like, of course. You know, downtown girls. Right. That's like a thing. Yeah, you know? sure. And and I remember like having some some females over at my house, and I was like, oh, okay, we met some club girls, some downtown girls. What are you gonna put on the turntable? Right. And I was like, okay, it's on, <laughs> it's on. And grandma was like, well, let's let's test that record because yeah. you don't, you know, you could really mess up the whole the right. whole party with this for sure. And you know, if you know what bitches brew sounds like, yeah. and you have friends that really care about you and they want you to hook up. <laughs> Friends who want to, <laughs> friends to hook up will stop the bitches brew oh, that's very amazing. quickly if you're 13 years old, you know? That's amazing. And uh, so I was like, man, just put on, like, I don't know, when we were 13, like, well, Jungle Brothers, I guess, was, like, the thing. 
Oh, maybe. Yeah, I mean, whatever it yeah. was at the time, you know, and and um, Kane or something, whatever, mm -hmm. right? And um, girls come over and like, oh, that's my jam. And I was like, oh. <laughs> okay. It's my jam, too. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And, but I, I, you know, I just always loved all music, and it, and it was yeah. just great to to have been able to live all those worlds, for sure. Yeah. So, how did you and Brian just decide to start a business together? And and like, what was the decision so, I mean, to get I, into I would the say, music? Business? Honestly, like the 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 crazy thing about growing up in New York in that era is if you did go out a little bit, like it seemed like everyone was kind of doing something. Yeah. Right, so if you went and hung out with friends who were like in the punk scene, and we didn't call it punk, we called it hardcore, mm -hmm. you know, in New York. Mm -hmm. um, if you were in the hardcore scene, like, you probably had a seven inch. Right. You probably sold t-shirts. Right. I had friends who did yeah, that. DIY culture. Right, yeah. and I was like, you know, if you did anything in like nightlife, you had some, like, you helped promote something or you did something. Yeah. Um, just like the idea of making money in music culture, it was like a no-brainer. Like I just, it, I can't. Exp there wasn't a moment where I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna do that." It was. I just, just kind of grew up thinking like, happened. "That's what you do." Yeah. I mean, I, I it occurred to me that people didn't all live in New York City and do this. Right. Because I watched the Brady Bunch. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of knew there were some people that did that. Right. But I didn't know them. Right. <laughs> so. Um, I mean, I just assumed we were going to do that. Yeah. My whole life. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually think. And, and what was the, well, t tell me about the partnership. I'm fascinated with partnerships. Sure. And like, you know, how does that, I imagine at that age, there's not like a conscious, like, well, this is your skill set and it matches well with mine. So like, but you guys have stayed partners. Yeah. Yeah. You've and, been and partners great friends. multiple times. Yeah. Right? Multiple times and great friends. Um, well, I think, you know, for on, this is you talk directly to entrepreneurs right now that are out there. I mean, you're taking on so much and it's so scary on, on in, in ways that people don't tell you. Right. Um, What's one? Well, one is every time your mail comes, you're afraid to open it. Yeah, you, you can you could. You could wear an EKG. You're afraid, and see, right? Because see the that could be some bill that you're not expecting that that's going to like bankrupt your whole business. Yeah, it's a lawsuit. It's yeah. a legal letter. It's like you didn't clear a sample. You know, you you have sure. an audit from you know uh, uh, some government agency because you you're paying people like you know under minimum wage or whatever the fuck you're doing because you don't know any yeah. better. Yeah, you don't know any you better. Got interns and whatever you, you right. don't know. Yeah. I mean, so the number one thing I think is great about having a partner if you're starting a business really young is just to help you be brave, mm. right? I mean, one of the things that I think Brian and I did for each other is help each other be brave and push each other to constantly learn, mm -hmm. right? Like learning more about the business, learning more was cool to us. Yeah. And it was a challenge, you know? So... Um, even though the, the skill sets weren't defined because neither of us had actually done anything, it was like, well, we, you know, we're going to figure this out. And if anyone's sitting on their ass, yeah. you know, that's a fucking problem. Yeah. So the, the nice thing about that, I mean, and, and to this day, there's things that, you know, right now I could tell you, like, there's things he's better at than I am and there's sure. things I'm better at than, than he is. You yeah. Know? Um, they're not as important now that, like, we're in our 40s. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um but at the time, it was just about, like, we can do this. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, the, you know the, as crazy as this sounds. And, and um, when entrepreneurs come to meet me, you know, if they want advice, the, the number one thing I tell them is, like, ask yourself really hard questions. And oftentimes, like, what a great partner will do for you is be that person who's constantly gut checking mm -hmm. and asking you really hard questions, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what's something that, that entrepreneurs don't ask themselves enough? Oh, gosh. Um, there, there's so, I mean. I'm sure there's a lot. Well, there's a, there's a great, uh, that there's probably, you know, if, if there's an entrepreneur listening to this, they, they've all probably listened to that TED Talk on the why of marketing. Mm -hmm. I always hear people like, yeah, that really changed my life. Yeah. And I feel like that's, that's a good one. To, and it kind of scratches the surface, really, 
because you need to ask yourself the why of everything. Yeah. Right. Which is like, do we really have a business? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, why? Like, and then once you figure out, like, what is your business, then everything becomes like, is it all laddering up mm -hmm. into making that bigger and better? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. What's the other the other great thing I actually challenge people on all the time is can you be number one at something? Mm. That's like the Jack Welch. Yeah, theory. it is. It is. Um, and I think Worked for I, him. Yeah. I mean, you know, when I was at South by with, with Kuali this year, I asked him, like, you know, what what's something like what's your superpower? Yeah. It, or what, you know, which is also like my way of asking him, like, what's your number one? Mm -hmm. And he was really quick to say the pen, mm. you know, my writing skills. He's like, I put my writing skills up against anybody. Mm -hmm. He's like, just look at my lyrics. I don't give a fuck about who your number one rapper is or anybody. Look at my lyrics, look at my pen, compare anyone's pen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because I've known him for so long, I was, I didn't, I didn't know for sure what he was going to say. And I was sort of prepared to challenge him on whatever he was going to say. And then I couldn't challenge him <laughs> at all because I believe that. And he, you yeah. know, and to this day, and it's not just because of my relationship, he, he is in my top five of all time uh, rappers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is like, every time I listened to him, I was like, man, look what he just fucking said, <laughs> you know? And it's great that he knows, like he knows what's going to make a, turn a fan into a super fan, mm. right? Because if you don't know the thing that's going to turn a casual, casual listener into a fan, into a super fan, that means you don't know the secret to unlocking your audience. Mm -hmm. You don't know your superpower. You don't know the <laughs> thing you could be number one at. Yeah. And until you kind of figure out all those things, you don't really know your business. That's great. I want to go back to something you said earlier about spending time in the, in the record stores. Cool. And, you know, as, as a father and... Uh, uh, you know, we're of age where we get to complain about young people today, right? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. so the world's just changed, right? Our, right. our, our you know, w we all now are, are always connected, you know, to other people. We don't have, you know, the opportunity that we used to have of walking the aisles, you know, crate digging or books, you know, meandering through bookstores or whatever, spending those like long afternoons where you're not really in contact. You got to work for it. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh what does that mean and 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 how do you know as somebody like who who saw the value of that mm -hmm. in your own life like yeah. how do how are people going to get that same kind of value today? Well, I think what we do as an older generation is we're always trying to sort of see younger people's world through our lens and I don't really know if there's value in that because what we remember was how how um, proud of ourselves we were for like uh, you know discovering stuff for sure, right? But I think there was also this other layer, this social layer, right? Like um, like who do you invite to the record store with you? That's kind of like oh shit, you got invited to go crate digging with DJ so and so, right? That's that's you know you're on the list, yeah. right? The, the other thing is, like, who made you mixtapes? And I'm not right. talking about, like, hip-hop mixtapes, right? I'm talking, like, <clears throat> someone discovered, like, um, holy shit, like, um, at a young age, London Calling is the most important album of all time, right? And so, like, not everyone can go out and just buy London Calling because, like, I don't know, CDs were, like, whatever. You know, it's a double CD. It's probably 50 fucking dollars, right? You know what I mean? So someone would make... right copies of London Calling, and then you knew, like, what their handwriting was, yeah. right? Because it was all about, like, your, you know, your cassette collection. Yeah. And if you went to someone's house and you saw that, you know, Josh had made them, because you know Josh, you know Josh, what, his, what his cassette spines looked like, right? <laughs> and you saw his cassette spine artwork, which was, like, the fresh, fresh thing back in the day. Everyone remember cassette spines? Like, yeah. And you went to someone's house and you saw that they, that Josh had made them uh, London Calling, he hadn't made it for you yet. It was, like, yeah, you know, there's a social element to this sure. that people don't really talk about. Like, damn, Josh, you know, that guy who's got the mixtape, he's cooler than me. I didn't get I didn't get my copy right. yet. I'm I might get mine next week. Right. But he didn't rush to make mine the way he rushed to make his. Yeah. Um That's you know, I just think there's different layers of what really happened when we were growing up. Sure. I mean, of course it was like people just love music for the music's sake and like, you know, we can sort of uh bemoan the fact that that might not exist. But also, look, man, 
how amazing is it that like your kids can hear like you know well i was talking to some friends and they said i need to really like listen to like you know the three kings and so i'm just going to go home onto spotify and listen to you know bb freddie and albert right like that yeah and they actually don't need to spend half a year trying to find those records you know what i mean yeah for sure like they're going to have they're going to discover different things they're going to have different social experiences yeah um the music's going to be there and Mm -hmm. you know i i guess we'll see but uh like your your kids will probably have good taste in music right or early at a really early age right they're not going to have to like sure. spend you know um like their formative years like unnecessarily listening to like billy joe glasshouses and chuck man jones <laughs> 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 although i don't know there's something kind of cool about that too you know yeah for sure there, i'll tell you one thing there's less to rebel against well yeah that i i don't i don't I'm not sure if I understand how rebellion works today. Yeah, I don't know either. I, I mean, well, I think there's a lot to... I th- I think by being an artist, the, the, one of the definitions to me of an artist is you're sort of dissatisfied with the world and you want to make it better. Sure. Um, and that, that doesn't mean that all art is political. And it doesn't mean that all art is social. It can be... You can be dissatisfied with the status quo of painting Mm -hmm. right and you just want Mm -hmm. to change it so i think rebellion comes in 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 different forms it it just might not all sound like you know um one of the album cuts on a suicidal tendencies album right it might just be different now yeah yeah or it might and and you know we're seeing you know with with run the jewels with prophets of rage yeah you know i mean look this is crazy like my son loves but actually it, it, because my 12 year old loves it my seven year old they love run the jewels which yeah. actually has you know it, which is probably if, if there's any parents listening they're like oh my god you're a really bad parent but i don't think so no. you know no. i don't think so at all i mean go you I, so my parenting philosophy which you know we hinted at before is to expose them to, to dope stuff yeah. and like don't be like worried if there's like you know profanity or like things that are like inappropriate like your kids are smart man yeah your kids are smart and they they do a lot of self filtering too of like you know what they what's going to feel good for them and what's going to feel awkward for them mm-hmm. um you don't force feed it to them you know because then all of a sudden it's actually not cool mm-hmm. you know yeah sure but um and you know, i remember like you know um my 12 year old being like yeah 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 this i, I heard you know, I, I I was thumbing through your playlist. You know, you don't even like you right. just kind of have your playlist. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I kind of discovered this Run the Jewels thing, man. Like, I'm like, oh yeah, cool. You know, mm-hmm. that's fine. Yeah, you do that. Yeah, yeah, we do that. With we we don't censor. Um, we just tell them like, you know, there's stuff in on screen and on records that you know we don't get to say because we're not making. You know, it's okay on the screen. Right. But you don't get to say it around the house. Like if you go, if you make a movie, then you know you can put whatever you want in it. Right. Yeah. But um, but that's the fun of of entertainment, right? Is that you get to live out some of that stuff without it in yeah. real life. Yeah, I think our kids are really smart. I mean, um, you know, it's so I have a, enough years of experimenting with just kind of like bringing them everywhere, concerts, yeah. art galleries, like whatever. Yeah. So far, I, I'd say it's going pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> like, I so. so I would say expose your kids to all types of culture. Yeah. Um, if they have questions, answer their questions. If they want historical... Con- I mean, one of the things they can do when they start asking questions is they, they may not understand that they need historical context, and then maybe you can help them out with that. Mm-hmm. Right? So when they say, you know, oh, man, I really, I'm feeling this rap record or something like that, You'd be like, oh, okay, cool. Have you listened to Slick Rick? And then have you listened right. to Rakim? And then you can kind of like walk them through that. Yeah. Or, uh, um, you know, they discover like, you know, s- some rock group that they're into and you can kind of walk them mm-hmm. through that or art or whatever. They just might not even know that that historical context even exists. So that's Absolutely. something you can do as a parent. And I think that's, and you'd be surprised how fun it is. Yeah. It's like a really, really fun, fun thing for you to do. Yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. And I, I remember as a kid, like, learning, 
you know, I just, for some reason, I always assumed every record I heard was the first song that artist had ever made because it was the first one I had ever heard for of. For sure, right. Like, I didn't understand right. catalog. Right, right. And so, you know, you said, like, Billy Joel. And so, for me, it was Uptown Girl. Right, right. Like, because I saw that video, and I just, I never heard of Billy Joel before that. So, that must have been his first record or whatever. And then, year, you know, years later, you discover, maybe not with Billy Joel, but, like, you discover all this rich history behind you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire was like, let's groove, because I was of that age. I, that get, I, get, I guess out. Jews were different where you grew up, so I don't know. <laughs> there wasn't mandatory listening. In, no. in, like, in New York, if Jew, your Jewish parents, Billy right. Joel was like mandatory listening. That's funny. No, my parents were hippies. They had a whole different... Okay. You all had other kind of Jews. Okay, gotcha. Right, yeah. Exactly. California. California Jews. I get it. Right. I get it. I get it. So, okay, what happened when Rockus blew up? I don't know if if Black Star was the first hit, or well, uh, well, so it kind of depends on like you know what you consider a hit. Um, but the first, you know, the first uh, our first full length album that you know uh, that people started writing about and cared about was Company Flow. Okay, yeah, and um, which is LP from Run the Jewels. That's right. And, that's right. So, so, but so, here's what I want to know: What happened to you guys, like as people? Yeah. Um. Not a, you know, not a lot of pa- there was never a lot of pausing ever. Okay, where we said great fucking job. Yeah. You know, um, what was the feeling? Was it like oh shit? Was it like, you know? No, I mean it all f- felt like I said like you grew up around it. Yeah, you grew up around like cats made records and did parties and went to clubs. So it's just sure. like, I mean. That's what we were supposed to do. It didn't feel that crazy. Okay. Didn't feel that crazy. Yeah. Um, no one went and bought anything no. out of this world? Not at all. No. Not at all. Um, and the other funny story that, that actually, that, that Kwali tells a lot, when, when, I, when I talk to him and I'm like, man, do people come up to you all the time and say, Black Star changed my life? He goes, dog, all the time. And the first thing I say to them is, well, you definitely didn't buy the album when it came out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because if you had bought the album when it came out, I would have been driving around a different kind of car. My life would be different. He's like, so I don't For know sure. who all these people are that are constantly coming up to me saying yeah. that this album changed my life because you definitely did not buy the album when it came out. Yeah. I've heard. I've you know, heard it him. came out. It came out <clears throat> the week of uh, Lauren Hill. Oh, wow. OK. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I've heard him talk, and, and uh, there was one talk where he, he said something about, like, yeah, I meet people who come up and say, I'm your biggest fan. Yeah. And he's like, what have you bought from me? Right. And they're like, nothing. But I got, you know, I listen on Spotify or, right. I, you know, whatever. Right. And um, I think that's interesting, you know, I don't know that we're going to solve that here, but, like, there is definitely not a feeling that we need to pay for art. Yeah, I mean that's that's an interesting one. Um, I understand where he's coming from, right? A hundred percent, and I I know, I know him well enough to understand like what he's trying to get at from that person. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the flip side, I think you can, in your heart, really feel like you yeah. are someone's biggest fan, sure. Even if you're not aware of the fact that they have, you know, two direct to consumer albums that are available. I mean, those those things, they 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 feel foreign, but. Yeah, um, you can feel an intense connection to an artist, and especially if you grew up in a world where you don't buy things anymore from artists. Right. Absolutely. I mean, like that question might seem may actually seem like crazy. Like, was I actually supposed to buy something from right. you? Like, I didn't. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you're just educating me. I just, <laughs> I just didn't know. <laughs> um. I mean, for artists out there, the uh, an interesting question is like, well, what are you selling? Yeah. Because if you're selling a mission, you know, if you're selling, you know, a, a deep meaning and someone says to you um, that they're, they're your biggest fan, well, then I guess you're, if, if then maybe your business is working, right? Mm-hmm. If that's really what you're selling. Sure. Right? Yeah. Business plan is working. Right. I sold my thing. My thing's an idea. Yeah. It's in people's hearts. Yeah. Now, 
that doesn't pay your bills. So then you probably have to have a more complicated business plan. Well, I mean, I, as you're talking, like I think of Shepard Ferry. Right. Right. And I think he's definitely got a mission. He puts it up very clearly on walls all over the world. Mm-hmm. Right. And he gives away his art for free in a mm-hmm. lot of cases. And yet he makes a fucking fortune selling shit. Right. Yeah. It's kind of, it kind of reminds me a little bit. I mean, that's, I think that's an interesting business model that musicians should look at. Um, unfortunately, it, it, it became a bit of a comical one with the whole Wu Tang. What, how do you say, I guess, a Martin Sh- Oh, yeah, yeah. That guy. Yeah. How do you say that guy's name? <laughs> Who knows? But everyone knows what I'm talking about. The yeah. Martin jerk that, that bought the, the Wu Tang album. But um, I think there's something interesting there. Um, Prints on walls, you know, mm-hmm. definitely work. Mm-hmm. Uh, the what a what a musician ends up doing to sort of build out their full business model, I think is still up for grabs right now. Yeah, I mean, where it works is in the pop pop music works, right? The, the everyone knows right now the business model around pop music works. You can make enough money off streaming and and your copyrights mm-hmm. right um to make a lot of money outside of touring right but that's you know that's problematic because that you, you know that works for a certain so like i don't think it works for pop music right it works if you if you are in a position to reach a massive number of people that's right with your art right and you know and i well i mean this is the other thing if you're an up-and-coming artist I mean, do you have to make all of your money through your art to really feel like you're an artist? Mm. I mean, that's something that I would say to anyone that came to me and was questioning their career mm-hmm. and wanted advice. Mm-hmm. Something I'd say to all your listeners, you know, it's like, uh, do you feel like do you feel like a failure? Like you're not fully an artist if you're not making all of your income from? The, I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think we. I, I, here's I think I think we've miseducated people. I know why. And I, okay, go ahead. Why? As speaking for all of my listeners. Yeah. Uh, because that's your because that's what your idols did. Okay, so here's I think we've miseducated people a little bit, both as entrepreneurs. I'm certain of that. Right. right. I think as you mean on this show. No, man, not on this show. <laughs> like I think as society, we you know we've idolized like a select few people, and it's yeah. you know, and it's not just musicians. It's it's entrepreneurs too. Right, where it's this idea like if you're not creating the killer app, you're right. not like you know absolutely you're not the next Steve, jo- right? So it's bad enough that you know we we all look up to Kanye and rightfully so for his music. I'm right. a, I'm a huge Kanye yes. fan. I'm a big big time Kanye fan for you know, his music. But but he also holds up you know the Steve Jobses and like so it's like now it's like we don't have it other idols. Right. We don't know it's okay. Like it's okay to like do your job make make your rent make your money and you can also do your art Mm -hmm. and be an artist Mm -hmm. you can also have your company with your friends on the side and be an entrepreneur yeah Yeah, you don't have to risk your entire livelihood to make your dreams come true right and it doesn't make what you do in my opinion any less authentic there's going to be people after you challenge them to this, that say, hell no, it's ride or die. Mm-hmm. And and the truth is, those people probably are the slightly artier people. They're the more driven entrepreneurs, right? They have to ride or die. And, and, and they make it work. And, you know, if you have to make it work and you do, good on you. It was always meant to be. But going yeah. back, like, going back to challenge, it's always about, like, you want people around you who are going to challenge you, mm-hmm. who are going to gut check you, like, I don't know if this is a good idea. How are you going to sell that? How are you going to make, you know, be open to being challenged? Don't surround yourself with yes men for sure. Well, I think that's a huge challenge for artists, and I, and I use artists and like anybody that's making art of any kind to get real feedback. Absolutely. Right. That that is, you know, almost impossible because you know your your mom and your friends love everything you do. You know, then you get a label or manager who yeah. has a vested interest and, you know, isn't necessarily giving it to you straight. And 
It's just one tough. Of the, yeah, one of the questions I get a lot is this, am I ready to launch? Mm. Is my album ready? Yeah. Is my app ready? Is my yeah. company ready? I mean, uh, this idea of you're not an artist unless you're launching products, right? Is an, it's, an, it's a really interesting one to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's a good place to always have conversations with entrepreneurs and artists around that, like, so tell me about your product and like, are you ready to launch? And like, what are you trying to do with it? And then yes. you just, and um, I think it kind of, um, there's two, two philosophies there. One is get stuff out in the world and get feedback. Sure. Right? That's the MVP idea. Right, exactly. Um, and I always go to Kanye because I think he's, he's really good at constantly like redefining these things. He's really, yeah. he's really fascinating to me. Right? And the fact that like he's, he's now putting out, at this point in his career, he's kind of putting out music and like iterating it, and, like mm -hmm. making changes. Yeah, Pablo, right? Yeah. I mean, he just kind of flipped the mo I mean, I can't think of any other major release ever that's kind of done that. Very, very no, interesting. I don't know. But on the other hand. Well, because in the past, you had to get the presses rolling. Right. Right. And on the other hand, he was this, he was this polar opposite example of, of somebody who was this incredible perfectionist, mm -hmm. right? Of like, it can't go out until I get it right. And there's this amazing video that I always tell people to watch uh, of him in the studio with Timberland. And, and so he's getting Timberland to work on his drums, on, 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 a, on a Kanye's drums. I don't remember, you remember the track I'm talking about? No. You remember? Mm -mm. And, and so when you think about like, okay, here's a guy like Kanye West, you know, you know what he's good at? Drums. Yeah. Right? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, here's here's something he's pretty fucking good at yeah but he's like okay but there might be someone who's better at me at the kick drum yeah. you know what i mean like i'm gonna get it so fucking perfect yeah that when you open up the phone it's nicer on the inside than it is on the outside you right. don't even know that it's nicer on i know yeah and so he was kind of the king of that yeah um and i think those are sort of the two the two um ways of looking at putting out product mm -hmm. and you got to kind of figure it figure it out for yourself and looking at your business model, some people's models work well where it's like, I'm going to put something out and I'm going to get some feedback from the marketplace and I could turn something else around quickly enough based on that feedback. And so it's kind of cool if it's whack. Mm -hmm. In fact, if mm -hmm. it's whack, I kind of want to know right away. Sure. Um, and then for some people's business model is like, it can never be whack. Like you can have no whack on your resume. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, the problem with that business model is some people, entrepreneurs and artists, get caught up in a world where they never put anything out. Right. And, you know, obviously that that is like um, it's paralysis. You know, the paralysis as an entrepreneur, a paralysis as an artist is like, you know, it's the kiss of death. Mm -hmm. Kids of Death is also consistently putting out whack shit, right? So <laughs> right. you got to kind of figure this idea of like, when do you launch your product? You know, um, outside of figuring out like, what's your mission statement? Who's on my team? Yeah. What's my superpower? Like these, these things all go together. And um, I was talking to someone, you know, just this is the kind of shit I do talk about all the time. I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to get it right for myself. Mm -hmm. And someone I really trusted recently said, you know what, man? It's all of those things. Yeah. You know, it's like at one point when people were trying to sell you better stereo equipment and they'd be like, well, now that you got the Macintosh amplifier, right. you really need the monster cables. Right. And if you got the monster cables, yeah. you really need the so-and-so speakers. You can't have good speakers without a subwoofer. And you're like, I don't really know if I need, the, do I really right. need all those Which things? is the thing that counts. Right. But right. I, I kind of think when it comes to like building like, you know, substantial creative businesses. Yeah. I think it's all those things. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I was talking to somebody about that today that, you know, you look at Beats or Apple or, you know, Uber. We were talking about those three. And it was like, those are terrible case studies because they're not, you can't duplicate mm. that. Like, there's so many factors, you know, and I think there are things you can learn from them, but you can't, like, dissect and say, let's just go do that and, and we're going to get the same result. First of all, the market's moved on right? yeah. because these guys have defined it and created the playing field that then everyone else has to play in. And so then these copycats spring up. Sure. But they're playing, they're, they're several steps behind. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's definitely a lot to, to, 
a good stuff to glean from those companies for sure. Yeah. I mean, the interesting one is Beats, which, you know, I don't know a lot about like headphones, but I've been told, you know, it's not a great product. Right. Sure. Um, and so that kind of goes against what I was saying a moment ago, which you kind of have to have everything. Um, although that might not be the case if you have Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre, you probably need a lot. Yeah, and I, and I, you know, but, like, but I think back to your point about perfection, right? Like there is such a thing as good enough. And I think there's such a thing. And by that, I mean, there's such well, a thing you know, where they, so the better, interesting thing is like, I, I think those headphones from what I, and I've read interviews with, with Jimmy, I think they accomplished what they wanted those headphones to accomplish. Right. right? I mean, like a lot of bass. Yeah. I mean, I think they, they, like they knew what they wanted those headphones to sound like now to someone else. Like, look, it's, it's an interesting story that it's not a great product. Right. I mean, I never heard it, you know, people that I Who's saw, people I saw on the subway not in their head, they all seem pretty yeah, fucking happy. Exactly. So I don't yeah. really know if it's if it's accurate. Yeah, I mean, and as, that's like, you know, the audiophiles is a weird geeky bunch that cares about a lot right. of shit that most people don't care about. Yeah, I mean, right. so it, it goes back to like, you know, what, what was your mission? If their mission was to make headphones that were really good at this one thing, yeah, right, which is like feeling more dynamic around a frequency... And they think this frequency defines that how people are going to feel most emotional about their music. Then, boom, they did it. I would just say, what if the mission is making people feel cool? Well, I know, but I think I think that that's another part of the mission too. But I think I think that's the marketing of the of the product. Like sure. I think there's yeah, a lot yeah. of different. Yeah. I think the product yes. mission okay. was that it has to be like this, right. and the marketing was yeah. to make people feel cool. Fair enough. Um, okay, we could do this all night, man. This yeah, is we can. fun. But um, I actually do do this all day. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Well, I want to get to what you do all day nowadays, but but I want to know, um, uh, you know, when Rockus ended. You know what else we could do? And you know, this is from hanging out w at, at the basketball gyms. We, we could we could talk about weird pretenders. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, Dude. almost like almost like any weird like new Ave band trivia. We could do that all day. You're, is there a podcast for that? You I'm sure there is. <laughs> uh, it's not mine, but I'm sure there is. Okay. And uh yeah, you're you seem to be a font of knowledge on uh, I I, I do I do know a lot topics. of obscure 80s uh new wave music that's, trivia. That's fantastic. Uh, I don't I I don't know that much about that. So like I I listen to all the music, but mm -hmm. I I never that wasn't the thing I geeked out on. Um uh, but you're a visitor. You can geek out. That's a cool thing about being a visitor in right. different sort of subcultures. Yeah, is you you can just deep dive, geek out on everything, and then be like, oh shit, I also want to geek out on that. And right, you know, um, yeah. and and just never get tired. It's fun. Yeah, it is fun. So okay, Rock ascended after how many years? Just about ten. Okay. Um, so what was the biggest thing you took from that? Um, the, the biggest thing I took was this, um, uh, being successful in a creative business is all about balance. I know that's like the biggest cliche in the world, but let me, let me try to unpack that, that silly cliche. Um, if you have, and I'll, okay, here it is. Here's, here's the balance. If you have a really, really hard nosed mission oriented artist on one hand, Let's and let's just for the sake of like argument, like let's put like most deaf and like quality, like yeah, like those guys knew what they wanted to do. Like yeah. they had like a really strong, strong mission statement, and um, <clears throat> then you have basically the the key to the, the easiest way to be successful in business, right? And you hear this term all the time is pivot, mm -hmm. right? So being flexible, mm -hmm. right? Knowing like, well, you know, what if we did this or what if we did that or like. We did this, like it'd be like a couple cents cheaper. Or, like, why are we shooting like you know on on right. you know on film if we shot it on video? Or like, why do, why are we recording to tape? You know, like let's be flexible. Right. And then you let's say you have you know your like uh, Quentin Tarantino, right? Or uh, yeah. you know that that kind yeah. of like I'm not doing any of that. Right. This is how I do it. Yeah. Um, it's about getting that balance right. Yeah. You know, um, because not. Not everybody can, like, <laughs> here's, a, here's a great example, right? Like, figuring out how to, like, merge those two worlds. So when we put out Black on Both Sides, uh, most came in the office, and he looked at the photo. It's a very, very, it's an incredible photo. It's an iconic photo. And he looked at it, 
and and he goes, okay, no, no writing on it. And, you know, he kind of said it in past. I, I wasn't sure if he was serious. <laughs> like, and then he kind of left, and I'm meeting with the art department. I was like, yeah, well, his name will go there, and, like, the album title will go there, so people will know. Because it's like, you're not, re- like, it's not like his face was, like, the most recognizable face in the world at the time. You got to remember, like, yeah. Miss Fat Booty hadn't even come out yet. You know, mm-hmm. and not that that was a huge song or anything. So it wasn't like everyone knew who he was. And even if they knew who he was, knew exactly what he looked like. And if they knew exactly what he looked like, which like, oh, that's him in that picture. So, I, you know, I just didn't even, it wasn't that like I ignored what he said. I literally wasn't sure if he was like 100% serious or not. Because it's hard to, he's, he's so artistic. And, and he's also sometimes like kind of speaks in like an indirect way. And, um, you know, he, he came back in and he was like, well, why, why is there an album title in my name right. on here? Like, I, I want to keep it pristine. Like, that's, that's, that's the vision, you know? And I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so what we ended up doing was putting a sticker on all the pressings. Uh-huh. So when you bought the CD or vinyl, the... Uh, his name and album title was actually a sticker. Okay. And uh, I I think it was like that for a long time mm. until Universal took over the catalog. Mm-hmm. And then I think they put it on because they didn't want to pay the extra mm-hmm. packaging fee. You know, so, and that was a good example of like where, okay, we had to pay a little bit more, but we got his vision yeah. intact. Uh, we were able to accomplish, you know, our marketing objective. Yeah. And that was like a really good example of where those two worlds can meet. So, so you know. But you... I think if you go, if, if you're too wishy-washy and you're like, if you're willing to sort of bend all the time, then you don't stand right. for anything. Yeah. And if you're constantly taking a stance, right? Because he could have also been like, no, no sticker. You like fight over everything. Yeah, you, yeah. you know what I mean? Like he, he's like, oh, okay, cool, I get it. Yeah. You know, if you're, t- if you're taking a stance on everything, it's almost like never launching your product. Yeah. Because you're constantly looking for a level of perfection mm-hmm. and nothing gets done. Yeah. So how much, you've had two businesses now since then, right? Uh, two, two since then, correct. Right. So, uh, so taking that lesson, I, I wonder, like, does that only happen in retrospect or can you engineer that up front? Oh, uh, well, I mean... This is why you have to teach your kids some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like the funny thing, you like kids don't want to hear. About, most kids don't really want to hear about business, but I think it's like actually one of the freshest things we could teach our kids. Yeah. Like, and kids need to like learn that business is cool, and like because learning about the fact that like in life, like one of the greatest lessons you can learn is about when it's time to stick to your guns and when it's time to be flexible Mm -hmm. and just knowing that that's going to be make or break Mm -hmm. for your t-shirt company, your skateboard company, your sneaker company, your production company, your movie, your television show, whatever the fuck it is that you're doing. Like, um, no one had that. I mean, like, it's something I kind of figured out along the way. Yeah. You know, and it just becomes like that. You realize that every single day you go to work to figure out that balance. Mm -hmm. But it would be like a fun thing to have known when I was like eleven. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> yeah. So, so how have you then approached your next businesses differently? Um, like, were you? Let me yeah. ask it this way: Have you? Are you conscious about like I'm going to take these lessons from this last experience? Yeah, I am and, conscious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm 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 conscious to a certain degree, but the other lesson that I don't I haven't talked about too much is you also have to have a complete, like, you have to go into things a certain, like, with a certain blindness as well. Mm -hmm. Because if you're always gut checking everything and you're thinking like, well, like, you know, if I, if I, if I, if I go all in on this plan, there's no room to pivot and blah, blah, blah. You know, if you're like overthinking things too much. Yeah. Again, like, you don't do stuff. And, And I'll say this, like, if someone had explained to me like how hard it was going to be to run a record label and like really, really explained it to me yeah. and I understood it, yeah. at the, I would not have, would done, have it. done it. If someone really, really explained to me how hard it was going to be to run digital media companies, I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. But then I don't really know what's easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like a, you know, 
Yeah, nothing. Nothing. I mean, you know, and if you if it sort of makes sense to you, and you're like, well, then like it, it goes back to when you tell someone like, I don't know if you need to be an artist, and like, well, I just need to do this, mm -hmm. and then it's like, okay, don't come to me when it's really really hard. Just know you have to. It's it's ride or die. Go figure it out. Yeah. And and just know that you've married yourself to that. Yeah. And be cool with it. Yeah, I've I've definitely taught a lot of people if you can, if you can, uh, if it if it makes sense to you not to be an artist, like if you can figure out a way that I say if you can figure out any other way. Well, what did I say? Like if you could live with not being an artist, then don't be an artist. Right. The only reason to do it is because you can't live without it. I mean, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because you know, that's how hard it is. So I mean, let me. So okay, so, so I'll give you I'll give you like, like my 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 three sort of origin stories okay. of, my, of my three businesses, yeah. and then you can you can tell them all at once, or you can piece them together. <laughs> to you. All right, so um, in, we talked a lot about rockets, but I'll, I'll just give you like an interesting origin story about, yeah. about that, and then I'll move on. Uh, when I was in college, uh, Brian Brader and I would uh, you know we'd make demos of like you know. Of local artists, some stuff we'd be a part of, some stuff that we, we, you know, we we would produce on it, or you know, we'd be involved in, in the packaging, and we definitely saw ourselves more on like the artist side, mm -hmm. you know, more of like, yeah, we're going to be more on the full full creative side, right? And we'd come in, you know, we'd come into New York and we'd go to parties, you know, maybe we'd go to like, you know, something like Patrick Moxie was doing or something like, you know. Morris was doing with Giant Step, and mm -hmm. then, you know, we try to meet people, and, you know, the, the fucking hustle, right? Yeah. And we got a meeting uh, with Dominic Trenier, who, uh, you know, probably a lot of your listeners know, uh, recently passed away. Yeah. And uh, Dominic went on to do amazing things, uh, manage Mark Ronson, uh, manage D'Angelo. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at that time, he was uh, A&R at Virgin. And so we come in and we got some stuff and we're showing it to him. And he's, he's being really cool with us. And he's like, you know, man, look, I don't think I'm hearing what you guys are hearing at all, <laughs> you know? But like, I'm looking at the packaging, I'm looking at you two, I'm seeing the hustle that went into getting these meetings. And I'm like, I just don't know if you're on the right side of the desk. Mm. That's cool. That's great feedback. And I, I went downstairs after the meeting, and I turned to Brian, and I was like, I want to do what Dominic does. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> that's you know, great. like, that's, that, we need to be doing that. <laughs> like, yeah. And, uh, you know, we always thought we'd be in the music industry. Yeah. Like, obviously, like, you know, that was a yeah. given, but, like, very much, like, the guy sitting at, behind the desk only was really clear to me then. Yeah. Where he was like, look, you know, you, like you got the education, you got the contacts. Mm -hmm. He's like, there's always gonna be people that are like cooler and better at music than you. Yeah. Like, he, he essentially, yeah. without saying it, very very early on, said to me like, figure out your superpower and double down there. You yeah. know what I mean? And yeah. and that was like, uh, I've heard you know I've heard from other people that he's also given them some really great life lessons as well. So that that that's part of the you know raucous origin story. Yeah, it's just an interesting sidebar. I, you know, I don't want to derail the story, but I, you know, I had a lot of those experiences when I was starting out in the music business, and you know, throughout my career in music. And and one of the things that I think is missing now that I spend all day talking to brands is like you don't have those conversations with brand people. You don't. You don't. What conversation? Like this sort of um, the like pass with caring and insight. No, I mean, look, this is the other, like, I think there's a world of uh, of people that used to be like music managers yeah. that really took their craft yeah. very seriously. Of and, and, and this world of mentoring, I think like one of the things, and like why I was actually excited to, to come on this podcast, and I think you and I talked a little bit about it, watching our seven-year-olds play basketball, is like there appears to be this world in like Silicon Valley where there's like this mentoring yeah. and like passing on advice and like, you know, investing in each other's startup. Yeah. And like, 
that's cool for those dudes. Right. Then, you know, but I think there's a world like uh, uh, of, of people that like grew up like how we grew up and like our connection. Right. Which is look, um, your, your listeners know what, what, you know, your past. And so the first magazine cover we got for Black Star was Herb Magazine. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of kooky to me. That people that we 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 have something unique as unique as as what's happening, you know, uh, in Silicon Valley. We have something special and unique, and yeah. and 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 it's not just people our age because we we all did something together. There's something very very unique happening right now in someone's home studio, and they're gonna take that tape and they're gonna bring it to an underground club and they're gonna do something cooler than we even imagined doing. Right. And what are we doing for them? We should be doing something for them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so I, I just like the idea of more mentorship uh-huh. just around people that are trying to be um, cultural entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I miss that. I saw that, you know, a lot, like I said, in, in music and now in, like, working with corporate brands. You know, like I had a lot of conversations in early in my career that were like, I'm not going to fuck with you on this project, but keep in touch. Like someday we'll do business together. And in a lot of cases we never did. You know what I mean? But like, but it, it was the like, I'm saying no to this thing, but not to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it's the exact opposite on the corporate side. Yeah. They're just like, no, we're done. Thanks. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, it's unfortunate. Well, there's, you know, there's an art. So there's, there's a, there's a two way art. There's an art to saying, I'm saying no to this, but you know, you seem cool, stay in touch. Yeah. And there's an art to accepting that graciously and knowing that doesn't mean email the person. Of course. The next day. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know what I mean? Of course. Yeah. And uh, I think in, in, in certain world, like it works well. And there's like that etiquette works really well in Silicon Valley. Right. Right. Um, the etiquette of of pitching a VC, of them saying, "Wait, I'm not cutting you the check today. Check in. Let me, you know, show me, like, you know, update me on your deck. Show me your numbers. I want to see your product. You know, mm-hmm. the next launch. Mm-hmm. That's really, really built into that culture. Sure. And everybody knows how to act. Right. They they under, yeah. they they know when yeah. someone says, "I'm not I'm not in on this round, or I'm not investing, or I'm not mentoring, or I'm not joining your board right now. Check back in." Everyone knows what that means. Right. And we just don't really have that um, that way of talking to each other in our world, mm-hmm. but I think it's needed. Yeah. So okay, I want to hear the origin of okay, of cool. Uprocks. So, um, I mean, with Uprocks, you know, Brian and I, um, we had we had been doing a label for over ten years. Um, there. There are some things that like there's a couple like little stories you know that that lead to this and I'm trying to like kind of boil it down in, in into like the essence of something. Go for it. Um, but the essence was you know I think in some ways we all we wanted to do a a company that can move the cultural dial, um, and we just knew that it, it, if it was going to be a record label, it was going to be Raucous Records. You know mm-hmm. that that's that's what that was. So it was what else is going to move the cultural dial. And we started messing around with bloggers and mm. we just felt at the time they seemed like blogging was like this very kind of punk rock group of misfits mm-hmm. scattered across message boards and, you know, um, blogger and blogspot and like, you know, maybe the comment section of like, you know, a Gawker media blog. And it was like, well, huh, this feels a lot like Raucous Records day one. Wow. You know? And um, what if we could get all these people together on one platform mm-hmm. was um, really, really the idea. And as long as they had like a strong, in the beginning, it was like we look at people with a strong voice that wanted to speak to something that like, that felt, you know, culturally like very authentic to them Mm -hmm. and so that could be anything it could be hip-hop but it could be football it could be it could be television it Mm -hmm. could have been video games you know it could have been like anything that felt really authentic Mm -hmm. to their voice that made them feel like 
they shouldn't be doing that same thing at you know a major magazine right. or at that same thing at a major newspaper. Like yeah. there was something about it that just felt like it didn't fit in, and that was always the the raucous thing as well, which was okay if shining suit wrap is dominating the airwaves, you know, ha- what can we do to rebel against that? Mm-hmm. And so there was definitely a feeling of like of of rebellion um, built into that. And so um, there's something that uh, there's a village voice quote that I just you just reminded me of. Um, they said rock has made hip hop a secret again. Mm. And this was like at the time when, yeah. you know, it was all about Mace and yeah. And uh, was that Tanahasi quote? Uh, is that Tanahasi? Yeah. 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 I mean, how, how many? Um, that's so cool. H- how many labels get uh, their obituary written by Tanahasi? Pretty, pretty it's fresh. a great story. <laughs> pretty fresh. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, it was great. But but you know, uh, but it reading that, and I get it. Like when you know, I know what that so, means I mean, in that context. But but I'm I'm curious now. Oh. Like in this new business, like are, are there any secrets left? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I think having, like, yeah, 100%. Like, I think that's a great question. I, I never think of it as term, in terms of secrets. Mm-hmm. But we do think about, like, what's that one thing we can say every single day where people are sort of thinking it in the back of their heads? And when they see the video, they read the article, they engage with it on social, they go, that's exactly what I was thinking. Mm. I couldn't, I, I mean... I couldn't put it in those words. I couldn't make that video. I yeah. couldn't really put it all together. Yeah. But that's sort of what I was thinking. You know, I kind of feel like that was people's reaction to to Black Star. You know, it's like it's like they were kind of thinking that they needed that. Like sure. it's a, when people engage with a great piece of content, right? It's like ah, that's exactly what I was thinking the world needs. You know, it's kind of like that's what makes people hit that share button. That's what makes people. Um, you know, comment on it. Mm-hmm. That's when you tell their friend that like, you need to read this, you need to watch this. There's that element of not saying, not saying the exact obvious. Otherwise, it's like you're just getting it everywhere else. So it is about uncovering. Um, sometimes it's cultural secrets, but sometimes it's like secrets are just sort of floating around in our culture. Mm-hmm. Like, what are all the things that people are thinking? Um, I'll, I'll just give you an example, and that, you know, this may seem obvious because you're a smart person and when i say this you might go duh but for the rest of the world they might go oh huh i was kind of thinking that right um you can be pro black lives matter without being anti-police and you can be actually pro black lives matter and pro police right and like let me let me let me make like you know a video about that let me write an article about that which we have you know Mm -hmm. and um and I look at something like that, I go, that's the sweet spot of like kind of uncovering something that seems so duh. And yet when I go and I read the thousands of comments that these things generate, um, I, I, I'm amazed that it, it, it feels like we've uncovered some insane secrets. Oh, really? So actually my thinking doesn't have to be so black and white, so polarizing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I did not know that. Right, because you've been trained to think that like you have to always think like this or like this, and well, we'll, and it, I think what we try to do every day at 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 Uprox is actually uncover these things that are kind of like what what like you wish you had your cool uncle to sit you down and be like, son, listen to me, you can be like this. And right. It's like, oh shit, <clears throat> yeah, because that flies in the face of the way that the dialogue's being shaped. That's in, right in most of media. That's right. Right, which is, and whether or not because, you know, that's what gets eyeballs is to take these extreme positions. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, but it's, it's one way, it's certainly one way to get eyeballs. I'm in the business of eyeballs too. Yeah. Um, and I, I've actually found it to be completely a radical thing to sort of find things that make me go, duh, that's, that's obvious. And yet for so many people, it's, it's not obvious. Here, like here, here, here's another one. Like you know, um, this is going to sound like okay. There's a problem with guns, right? 
there's, okay, there's a problem with people being shot by guns. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there's a problem with people being shot by guns. So we should get some more information about gun use. Everyone's going duh right now, right? Okay. So we we've done we've done that video, we've done that article. Like that's not a duh thing for most people. Right. It's a it's a it's a it's a wild concept for some people. What do yeah. you mean get information? Like what are you trying to do? Right. I just think like if you want to solve problems, people getting shot is a problem. We should get information. I don't find that to be a radical concept. Everyone's nodding their head in here, so I don't think anyone thinks I'm radical. Right. Do you think I'm radical? No one thinks I'm radical in this room. Uh, I, but it's funny you say this because hearing you tell this story, now I get it. Like, meaning, you know, I, I kind of was like, I don't know if I see the connection from Rockets to Uproxx. Mm. And I know they're not the same business right. at all. But like, um, but you know, I kind of, you know, it's, I, but I've been curious, you know, how do you go from that business? To mm -hmm. And the way you just described it, I totally get it. Right. Because I think that's what Rockus did for hip hop. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Good. I like it. Good. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because I think, you know, it, again, like the, the duh was like, you know, it was, it was back to like, you know, whatever was on MTV at the time, you know, Mace and, and whatever. And, and it was like, well, that's how it has to be if you want to, if you want to sell records. Right. And, um, and what you guys showed is, well, it doesn't have to be that way, right? And and maybe we don't sell the same number of records, right? That's not the thing, but but you can still, you know, make music that, you know, is maybe substantive or just that people can care about in different ways. Um, and and then b both of those things can have value, and you can add to the conversation. No, I mean, I. Thank you for making that connection. Now, I mean, I'll tell you, like, very impassionedly in, in the way that we, we, we were very, con like, you asked me, like, how we felt when records kind of blew up. Yeah. Um, and we never patted ourselves in the back around sales. Like, that was always expected. Like, get these things on the radio. But we were very conscious that the content was special. Yeah. Like, I would definitely go to shows, and I, and, and I remember, like, at that time, you know, it would be, like, maybe a Most Def show, and Kwali would show up. And Common would show up, mm -hmm. and Dela would show up, and, and Q Tip would show up. Right. And, and I'd be like, I wanted to just go out in the audience and, and grab someone and be like, Do you fucking understand what's happening here? Yeah. This is history, yo. Yeah. Um, and we felt very conscious of that. Um, and I will say, like, every single day, you know, in the writer's room at Up Rocks, there's like this idea that we reach millions and millions of people, and there's a responsibility to try to like, you know, look, there's a responsibility sometimes just to like bring people in. And there's a responsibility to actually like affect the way they think about the world. Not, and again, it's not like, hey, we want to take in people that are voting for this person and make them vote for that person. Mm -hmm. What we actually want them to do is, is just stop thinking that everything is black and white. Mm -hmm. We want them to actually think that you can, it's cool to change your mind, right? It's cool to actually want to get information. Yeah. You know, and if you actually are open to information, maybe you will change your mind. So and it could be about anything. It could be about, um, and it doesn't have to be always the most serious topic. So, it, it could be about like how you feel about grunge music, right. you know, but hopefully it's just this idea of getting smarter and cooler and more open about things. So that's pretty different than the narrative that you hear generally about digital media. Well, I mean, I think the narrative you hear a lot about digital media is a lot to do with the the syndication of the content, not so much the content itself. I don't think people talk a lot about the content itself. Mostly because I think it, there's so much of it and it feels so disposable. Yeah. Well, and, but that's the narrative that, that I generally, that yeah, I'm talking sure. about, right? I mean, and, and, you know, when you, whether it's, you know, BuzzFeed or Gawker, yeah, or, yeah. right? Like it, it's that, it's that there's this, this, uh, there's so much of it and it's so disposable right and so what i'm curious about though is you have this other vision mm -hmm. how do you find the people 
to work for you that share that vision? And, and how do you keep them I have, focused on I, have, I, have, I just have the coolest people. Yeah. I just do. I just, like... Um, what, just, what, what's that a result of? Well, I think part of the... Like, one of the reasons that um, we have so many good people across our business is um, both editorial and studio were sort of built before they came together. Mm. And they were kind of built as family businesses, right? So, um, you know, um, most, like I would say a huge part of the editorial staff was built when we were a completely independent business with no VC money, mm-hmm. um, running it out of my bedroom. I, I signed every single check. Yeah. And I really like made sure that there was like a relationship and that like, I really saw eye to eye with every single person. Yeah. You know, you take your eye off that ball when you get investment and, you know, sure. your your numbers are much, much bigger. Yeah. And and the same thing goes on the studio side. And then um, basically the business was like, let's put, you know, this editorial staff together with, um, you know, this studio staff and this sales staff. Right. And what had to happen then is that the guy who runs the studio, Ben Blank, who I also think is a genius, we had to spend a year like really challenging each other, mm. you know, yeah. really, really gut checking each other. So that, that, again, that's a great, you know, that became a new partnership for me sure. in, in my life. Yeah. Um, and it was funny. We, we talk about it all the time that people legitimately thought we'd like dislike each other. Uh-huh. I, I so, was like, Hey man, you guys need to kind of, you know, you need to cool it in the office. Right. And I was like, Nah, man, that's just yeah. that's just two Jews battling it out, man. <laughs> like we're trying to get to the truth, you know. Right. That's that's just how we, we're doing it. Yeah. And um, we, uh, we we you know we would figure out like, well, what's this person's strength and what's their weakness? You know, are we right. working on the right content together? And just generally challenging each other. And and to so, it, and it really it really made things much stronger. So if I were in the office, what's something I would hear you say over and over? Um, what's the one thing? Like I always, I always like with you know, anytime I see something, like what's the one thing I'm supposed to get out of that? Mm. Like what's the one thing? Yeah. Uh, I just came from a meeting. You know, we were talking about like some videos, and um, you know, we we're tossing around titles, and um, it had to do with uh, uh Halloween. It's mm-hmm. like so we're planning Halloween content, and you know, Halloween becomes this like insane time for like cultural appropriation. Right, where it's yeah, like, like sure. all things that we know are okay get kind of like tossed out right. in the window. Yeah, um, and, and you know, it's also like a little confusing too because if you're a kid, you don't really like you know. Right. Well, if if so and so is my hero, right. right? If Colin Kaepernick is my hero, like, is it not okay? Where does like is it okay for me to wear his hair? Right. Is it okay for me to wear his skin? Right. Like, what's not okay? Sure. And if it's not okay, explain to me why. And then how am I supposed to be my hero for Halloween? It's kind of a complicated thing. And I would say like, it's well, interesting. you know, and it's trying to kind of figure out like, well, what's the one thing that people can kind of be like, I get it. You got to be like a Star Wars character. <laughs> if you don't want to be a Star Wars character. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, like it's manufactured to be like, it's got to be a licensed, Yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, we, t- we talk officially up, licensed costume. Yeah, figuring out like the one thing is something you would probably hear okay. a lot. That's good. So I know you said, um, and the other one you would hear, and we've talked about it a second ago, is like, what's going to make me go, duh, right? And I think that's the sweet spot where it's like, oh, okay, everyone I know who's really smart and cool is going to be like, yeah, that totally makes sense. But like the rest of the world, because we want to reach millions of people, are going to be like, kind of thrown for a loop. Yeah. Yeah. And we want to throw people for a loop. Yeah. Um, I know you said, like, you you know, you kind of take it in stride, you, you know, the successes. Mm-hmm. Um, what about, what's been the hardest day? Well, listen, here's the thing about being an entrepreneur. Like, there's so many hard days. Like, and I, and I, and I kid you not, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, it, it, it's like the, every time the, the, the mail comes, it's scary. 
Yeah. <laughs> and and um, but what what happened? You know, once uh, look, there there is times when when Uprox was completely independent, where I had to call a staff and be like, I, I mean, can, can I pay you guys next month? You know, um, there was a moment where we just we had we had serious serious money problems at at, at Rockus, and um, it was like, okay, we're not getting any distributor money to make a video, and and I don't know who's going to get paid. But you know, I think if we can get this song cracking, and uh, we'll we'll get a new distribution deal, we'll get some new money, blah 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 blah. And um, Pharaoh had the brilliant chorus of of my life, and uh, and then um, Styles ended up on the record, and we made that video with like um, kids from NYU, and mm. this was like when people like just didn't do that. Right. Like, that was totally different. And then yeah. we got that deal at MCA, and uh, I was like. You know, no one had been paid for a while. I mean, like you know, we got money back from MCA, and that yeah. worked. That worked out. And yeah. and uh, you know, it was kind. Of, it was funny once we did that video, and they and MCA found out how much they had. Like they thought they were re- reimbursing us this insane check, right? And they're like that's it. And yeah. then they and then they made me stand up in front of like the entire company and explain to them like how we made the video, and and. And Jay was like, "Well, I want all our videos to be this cheap now, because <laughs> I love this video, and he made it for no money, and, wow. and that's why no one, I don't think, ever talked to me from yeah, the MCA sure. Video Services Department." <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, that's that's great. But I mean, you know, it it, it sounds so corny, but like, there's always going to be really, really rough days where you have to deliver bad news, yeah. and it's it sucks, yeah. it's fucking terrible. But you you kind of again you you compartmentalize it as part of like your overall mission sure and and what you're doing and you, you kind of make sense of it yeah um okay i have a, a lightning round that before they kick us out i, I, want, I gotta ask you no i think i might ask you things also. okay <laughs> i'm kidding I'm go for it no, um, no. okay so uh what's one thing you know for sure <laughs> no one is. I'm still figuring this out. No, Maybe we don't bad. do our lady. Right? What's one thing bad. I know for? I don't know. I don't know because I'm just gonna. I have like I don't want to give you guys cliche. Honestly, um, give us the most cliche answer. Um, where else is on your lightning round? Lay the same all to me. What's something you used to believe and then you decided you've been wrong? <laughs> uh, we can cut these out. It's fine. Okay. What talent have you always wished you had more of? If you knew you couldn't fail, what other career would you choose? You know what's really funny about these questions? I don't know if we'll keep this, but like they all feel like they're, they're all sort of things like I've kind of like convinced myself never to even like dwell on. You know what okay. I'm saying? Like, all right. Because like my, my whole sort of thesis is like uh, I'm not good at a lot of things and okay. I would fail at a lot of things. And so yeah. my whole thesis is finding things that like, you know, um, like I love to draw and I love to play music. I'm not really good at either one of those things. Okay. I, I do. <laughs> I do know I love my kids. I mean, you know, I don't know. The obvious. But um, who would you be most excited to learn as a fan of your work? Oh, my God. Who, that's a really, really interesting one. Um, so, OK, that's a, who, would, who would I be most excited to learn as a fan of my work? Um, there. When I think back about like what like kind of blows my mind about um, people that have really influenced culture, there's that like era of like Blondie and and TV Party mm-hmm. and Basquiat, mm-hmm. and so to me like they literally invented like what we think of as cool like in every way. Yeah. Because cool before those guys was like almost like kind of like like maybe maybe Elvis maybe like Dean Martin. You know what right. I'm saying? Like. Yeah. So this Very idea, different. right? Like this idea of like street culture being yeah. cool, and like they kind of invented that, right? Yeah. And the person who doesn't get a lot of credit is Chris Stein, right? And so people think of Blondie, they only think of Debbie Harry, right? But it's it's you know it's it's as much uh, Debbie as it is as Chris, and Chris was also um, either like co-founder or co-host of, of TV Party, uh-huh. and and okay did all the music 
for um, what, what's Henry Chalfant's movie? Uh, uh, Wild, Wild Style. Style. Wild Style. Wild Style. Wild Style. Right, he did all like so he like he went in the studio and he made all of those all all of those beats that you know I think maybe Flash looped up. I'm not really mm-hmm. I'm not sure how they like ended up sounding more hip hop, but like he he made that music, which also means that. When you listen to uh, Illmatic and you and you hear that sample f- from from Wild Style, that's Chris Stein. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't I don't know him or anything like that, you know. But he's just like one of these dudes where I'm like, man, like f- from 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 Blondie to to TV Party yeah. to to like Wild Style, like. Uh, so I'd be pretty stoked if he was like just like a regular Up Rocks reader. See that answer made me glad I stuck with the lightning round because <laughs> <laughs> we get there. That's great. Did you see the, the Blondie documentary? Of course. Yeah, it's great. Of course. It's great. Um, what do you collect? I know you used to collect records. Yeah, what I What do you collect now? Uh, I think I have generally like a collector's mentality. Uh-huh. No, I'm not like an uber, uber crazy collector either, though, because I like, just because I like to, I like different things. Um, but what's that, like, what's But I have, you know, I have records. I do yeah. have, I do still have records. Uh, I have comics. Okay. Um, I have, you know, a... Uh, this is gonna. I have an art collection, you know, uh-huh. which do, which doesn't mean like I wear an ascot or anything. <laughs> <laughs> it just means like Jared's I, wearing an ascot right now, by the way. It, it it just means like I just like art, which yeah. which could be a lot of different things, you know, sure. in in general. Um, but I I like to, you know, if if especially if it's a friend or I know someone, and someone can tell me the story. Yeah. Um, I would have a wine collection if I could. Okay. You know, I just uh, don't have the space or like the time to actually yeah. do it. But uh, like, just like I like the stories of art or the stories of like a record or mm-hmm. I don't. I like when someone tells me the story about like a wine bottle. I yeah. find it fascinating. Totally. Me too. So I kind of like the idea of collecting different things and hearing the stories behind that stuff. Mm-hmm. What's the last great book you read? Um, I read a lot of books, and so I'm a, I'm a huge reader. I've always been a huge reader my whole life, and I always read a lot of books. And my response is always like the book that I'm kind of reading right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and uh, right now I'm reading uh, um, one of the books I'm reading right now is Herbie Hancock's uh, oh, yeah. autobiography. Possibilities. Yeah. yeah. So have you read that too? So good. I mean, I love it. What a fucking G. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and he has so many amazing things to say. Um, that if you really were trying to like figure out your life, yeah, as an artist, right. I could really recommend no other book like besides that one that I think would like just blow your mind. Yeah, and wow, like he's literally like the he's like okay, him and Chris Stein. I don't take back my <laughs> other answer. Herbie and Chris Stein, like reading that, I was like, man, this guy's like the Forrest Gump of culture. Yeah, from hard bop to funk yeah. to hip hop to electronics to like. I mean the the to technology. Mm-hmm. I mean he's been he's in the forefront of everything. It's just mind blowing, and he's very philosophical. Yeah, and he's very spiritual. I love that. I mean the the story, like you know, he's been with the same woman for mm-hmm. decades. Mm-hmm. They've lived in the same house up above Doheny. He tells the story of buying that house. He still got it, and that he, he had that cobra. Mm, the cobra, and like just great stories in that book. It, it's unbelievable. So guys, check that out. Um, I, I, you know, one of these days what I should do, because people ask me this all the time, I need to make a great list of books and, and just put it on some, yeah. like a Tumblr or something. Put it on Up Rocks. Put it on Up Rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, yeah. I have a place. I have a place to do that. Right. Good point. Um, what movie do you think you've seen the most? Um, Conan the Barbarian, probably. Wow. Uh I've seen Conan a lot. I've seen Flash Gordon a lot. I've seen <laughs> Star Wars a lot. <laughs> uh, that's funny because that, that that answer it's like never a very good movie. It's just like yeah. I mean, I'll tell you another. No, funny, because we just see you see him. Yeah, I'll tell you like a funny story. Like, so my thing about like art in general, though, it always has to do with memories as yeah. much as it has to do with the art itself. And I just have like really really good memories about like Conan and being like. Just my, my mind being blown, and I actually feel really, really good every time I watch uh-huh. it. Yeah. Okay, last one. Favorite DJ? Uh, I, you know, it's funny. I, I've had an answer to this in the past. Yeah. And I, I uh, but I don't, you know, I don't know if I, if, if I feel that way anymore. Um, I'll, I'll say this. 
you know, if I really look back at my life right now and I were to say, like, there's DJs that have, you know, skills and there's DJs that, like, you know, you've been to a certain party and they've changed your life. Right. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say what DJs influenced my life more than anybody. Okay. And, and that's an easy one for me. That's Stretch Armstrong. Okay. Nice. Well, Stretch has been on the show. We love Stretch. He's been on the show? Cool. Yeah, yeah. Him, him and Bob came on. Oh, nice. For the movie. Yeah, yeah. I was a, 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 what an awesome movie. I went to the L.A. premiere. Yeah, me too. Yeah. We didn't see each other. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Dude, did we get to, I don't know if we got to any of your questions. I think we did. I mean, like, we talked about the stuff that I talked to entrepreneurs about, so we did really good. We did awesome. Dude, what a great interview, man. I Thank appreciate you. that. I did good? Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Uh, so... Where do we find you? I don't know if you're out there publicly. Yeah, or, oh, I'm, or just yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, uh, I'm Jarrett Meyer on Twitter, um, and that's probably the the best place to kind of you know. Up, Otherwise, up, just go to uprocks.com. Just go to uprocks.com. Videos all day long, and 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 and, and you know you can find me in the comment section there. <laughs> you can find you can find me commenting on some uprocks stuff on on Facebook, um, and you know I'm around. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yo, that was Rebel Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. Hit us on Twitter at Rebel Radio Net. Leave us a review on iTunes. Find us on Facebook. Or uh, just come by the house and tell me what you thought of it. Knock on the door. I'll make you a tea. And come back next week for more Rebel Radio.